Uh, welcome back to Visions of Life 2 author artist series. Today we have Paco Aramburu, who wrote the short story, The Predicted End of Will, which was inspired by Bruno Cerdo's painting, Flora of the Subway. Paco, your story seems to capture the otherworldliness in Bruno's painting, even to the point that you have the prediction written out in Old English. How oh, yeah. did you come up with the story? The Predicted End of Will starts with an old manuscript that is supposedly five, six hundred years old, but it talks about the life of the person in the, in the present. I like discovering that there is a destiny that you don't know about. Today, we all seem to have this conception that we're master of our own will. I, I'm not sure that that's true. P partly it was my experience uh, when I was in Argentina. I, one day my wife was uh, accused, but they came after a friend of ours who was in the same union that she was. They took him and dis disappeared him and killed him. Suddenly that afternoon, we decided to leave the country. <laughs> Within two weeks, I, I was in another country and we had no future. So it's destinies are kind of a thing of mine, maybe because of that experience. Credit to you. Sounds like you pulled from that to find a creative outlet to express yourself. One of the things about your painting that I liked was elevation of a common circumstance, like being in the elevated train to a work of art and makes it a new way of looking at things. And in the Renaissance, the paintings were about either angels or, or consequential people. In, in your painting, you did the common person that travels on the L. I like that. Well, I've always been attracted to urban life. I grew up kind of in an ur urban environment. You know, I took the train a lot, and, and I, I've always tried to juxtapose these these mythological narratives in, in a modern context. And the model that I was inspired by was really kind of an earthy young lady, and I just thought she was perfect for the, the main character. I was trying to represent this kind of allegory that, that might be playful to the viewer, where they can try to guess what what she's doing and why she's there and, and yet you can't help but notice her when you see the painting so you didn't have the model actually go to the l's train and stand there while you take a picture of her back then i literally had to go there with a camera and i would get bothered by the authorities like what are you what are you doing taking a photo of the outside of the train even though i did take photos but not with her posing in the train i had somebody stand on the train but i then i superimposed her once i had the composition figured out when you're standing in the train you, you you're, you're, it's hard to get the right perspective. So I had to visualize how it would be looking into the train rather than being in the train itself. I was trying to make this commentary where we're all collectively in these environments and yet rarely does anybody notice each other. The head of this, the last woman on the right, brings the eye into the the, the main figure, the one in yellow. And it's very much a, a Renaissance composition, which the composition is very, very well done. Very interesting. Thank you. I spent a lot of time composing because I want the eye to keep moving. I'm directing or choreographing this scene the way I want people to see it. So that's definitely a, a very big part of what I really, truly enjoy doing. I have another painting here that is called Set, Set It Free. And it's got that same just opposing the old and the new. This was done around the same period. And yes, the playfulness of her looking at the balloon and the, setting it free and the man being video or videotaping with a British outfit, it kind of a whimsical connection to the past. The policeman just not even caring what's happening. He's just writing the ticket. Just this contrast of this, uh, this dominant authority figure with this playful scenery. I just thought this challenged the viewer, like what is really happening here? Well, it makes you think about what people in the past think about us. How, yeah. If you were to write a story based on this painting, what would you be thinking of? Well, I, I would write something about the girl. She's letting go of the balloon. Maybe she's letting go of her innocence. And uh, she just learned something about the guy in the, with the camera that is not that good. So, of course, those two yeah. are in the Living Artist book. There is the other painting that I'm going to show next. Yeah. I'd see oh, yeah. Bruno is there uh, thinking behind this painting. Well, this was, this was my surreal period. So this was the only still life that came out of that series. And I wanted to do an animated series with a sense of you know no gravity 
I had never seen it done before. And I literally created that scene. I had all those objects on strings and suspended in air. And I, I literally painted from the actual setup. It was a, a totally different interpretation of what a still life usually is about. So here, a very big painting, by the way. The rope is around yeah. the neck. And yet it's a mannequin. So, you know, there's a little bit of a metaphor there maybe about humanity, who knows. And the floor is really symbolic because there's this endless perspective of this renaissance grid renaissance masters uh, developed to really revolutionize the illusion of space on a flat surface so i i calculated it just like they created their spaces for their this is funny because i used to paint too i'm a recovering artist in this painting it feels like these objects are are giving a personality uh, and, and, and a dynamic as well. I also wanted to mention that paint was done with a monochromatic underpainting. So I really tried to enhance the sensation of color by glazing color or transparent layers on a monochrome underpainting, which is a very traditional right. technical application. So the reds that you see, they're very illuminated and you can't do that without glazing color. So, so that painting really has a, a really strong glow uh, when you see it in person. So Paco, if you have to write a story about a still life like that, that is motion, what would you think about all these things moving? Your stories are always very imaginative. If anybody can write a story about that, it's you. It could be also um, interesting to turn it upside down and, uh, and be the, the story of uh, falling, there is a, a sense of um, like almost like a ballet, you know, of, of things dancing to some music or something. And then there is there is a book there, and and uh, I wonder what it says. Some of the paper that is floating, I had my children draw on it, so it looked, you know, a little playful. And I think one of them was like a, a sunshine. And so when you come up with your your writing material, what is your process? The main thing for me is to come up with a character. The character is the main driving force through any story. When the character has some motivations, then I get the character in trouble. And the more trouble I can get him, the better. And then see what happens. Thank you, Paco and Bruno. Sure. You can all go to crowwoodspublishing.com to get more details about the book. You can also buy the book on Amazon, as well as on crowwitzpublishing.com. I'll see you next time.